Welcome everybody. My name is Daniel Medina with Investors Advantage. For those of you who don't know us, we're a financial planning and money management firm in Westlake Village. We've been in Westlake for the last 30 years and the company was founded in 1979 by John Grace. John, it's all yours. Thanks, Daniel. And for those of you who don't know, the math man, Daniel Medina, has been going on been with us for going on 14 years now. And then uh, we're delighted that Jasmine Alvarado has joined us. Uh, who, uh, it, by the way, is kind of interesting. Uh, she uh, went to Midland University on a wrestling scholarship. She's the only woman I know who has, who's, who's ever been a wrestler. It's just kind of interesting. Now, speaking of interesting, let's put things in perspective. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the three things you should focus on. But let me help you focus on this, uh, this market right now. And, you know, it would appear as though we're hitting new highs every day. And it has been quite robust to the upside since about the 23rd, 24th of March. But the NASDAQ is the only uh, index that's actually in positive territory. I mean, it's just hard to fathom. And not by much, a whopping 4.9%, uh, I believe, as of today, 4.9% as of today. Uh, the S&P is off 6%, and the Dow is down 10%. So, I mean, that's quite a wide range, and that's including the, this week. It's been a magnificent week, and I think the Dow was up about 2% uh, just today. That's, that's a huge number in one day, and yet the Dow is still off 10%. Kind of hard to wrap your mind around that, but that's the reality. Let's dig a little further in terms of reality. This comes from economist Kevin Hassett. You see him on TV a lot. He's a senior advisor and former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Trump administration from 2017 to 2018. Just last Sunday, he said unemployment could peak in June and remain in double digits through November. So it'll be interesting to see how this market plays all this, but right now it looks like it's a, a little ahead of itself, uh, looking for every green shoot it possibly can find. Uh, in meantime, the very next day, Christina Hooper happens to be uh, chief market strategist at Invesco warned on Memorial Day that the coronavirus is not the biggest threat to the market. I think she has a point here. She sees the flaring U.S.-China trade tensions potentially doing the most harm to stocks in the near future. And I don't think that's been, uh, uh, you know, playing out in the market so far. I think it's been much more short-sighted. Now, to help put things in perspective, you might remember the tariff war uh, resurgence you know, if, if, if we go through another one, it could be a direct hit to the market. And we saw in late 2018, remember fourth quarter 2018, markets off 20%, and a couple of times 2019, the tariff war was a very, very, very problematic issue. It looks like it's uh, something we're going to be going through again, as she was talking on CNBC on Trading Nation uh, last Friday. Uh, and so, you, you know, this may be the decoupling from the economy and, and, and the stock market. In other words, what we're seeing is a, is a great disparity between what the stock market is doing, what Main Street is going through. Huge, and probably a lot of that has to do with all of this, these Fed funds coming into the equation. So, you know, uh, we've got Beijing, who announced a plan for new security measures against Hong Kong last week. That sent the Hang Seng into the worst session in about five years. Uh, President Trump, uh, considers a move a human rights violation, and he warned Washington will react very strongly, that's his quote, in response. Uh, and then last Wednesday, the Senate approved, uh, passed legislation that could force Chinese companies to delist from U.S. stock exchange. So there's a, a lot of dirt being thrown about, and this is uh, more than hyperbole. Uh, now, going back to Christina Hooper, she says a couple other things that were interesting. Her first best base case is the war of words between the countries is rhetoric. Uh, and it ultimately uh, may derail progress on the trade front. She, however, is, is, is both high on the U.S. and high on China. So that's one of the uh, kind of a nice things to be able to talk to or listen to, someone who has a perspective on both sides of the pond, as opposed to those who just represent what's going on here. Um, but she does believe that, uh, you know, there is a threat with this uh, new noise about a potential U.S.-China trade war. So that's kind of an update of the market. Here's the agenda that we're going to go through. Uh, three things you should focus on. And, and by the way, we think there are three essential uh, things that you should be doing. Um, but let's, let's talk about uh, our agenda. And this is what we're going to discuss uh, as we move forward. Uh, okay, we're going to look at the recovery possibilities, uh, the three things you should focus on. And then we've got a, a great presentation particularly for business owners, but for anybody 
who really wants to represent themselves as top tier. Uh, and I'm delighted that uh, my good friend Michael Soboleski is joining us for the second half, uh, where he'll be talking about how to make your business roar, there's a reason for those to be in all caps, uh, like a tiger. Uh, and there's uh, there are just some practices that the best and the brightest seem to do routinely, consistently, not haphazardly. You know, they are consciously competent as opposed to anything other than. And I certainly want to learn from the best and the brightest. And I know you do too. So uh, Michael does a lot of work in this regard with businesses around the, the country. Uh, some of them with annual sales of $20 million or more. So clearly they're, they're, they're hiring the best and the brightest. And I'm glad he's, he's, he's with us to help us become uh, uh, more bright. <laughs> All right, so here we are. We, we've been, President Trump has talked about it's going to be a V-shaped recovery, third, fourth quarter, just going to be remarkable. Well, I, I'm, I'm not drinking that Kool-Aid. Uh, I, I hope he's right, but um, he may not be. So, you know, this is a, is a chart that we came across. We thought it was really good to help you see, you know, what are some of the, uh, the, the outcomes as a possibility. Uh, like this. Jasmine Alvarado. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, you, you know, is uh, in more of an L shaped. I think that's a real possibility. Uh, the one in the middle is a U shaped, and then we've got a one over here. Is it swish shaped or partial? No. But uh, you know, I love it when people all agree. I submit that when we all agree, we're missing something, and it's probably going to be something else. But you can see that we've uh, kind of graded these. Uh, between low probability, kind of the L-shape, if you will, on the left to the bottom to the right, uh, moderate prob probability in the yellow right-hand corner, and then the green uh, between, you know, uh, the vi virus uh, resurgence, uh, and, and we've returned to the same kind of scenario that we've been going through. So, um, so what should you focus on? We're going to suggest that, uh, with our next slide, that we uh, start with goal planning. Uh, that we identify, we don't just put money in some place and hope it makes money so we can think that was intelligence and we feel smart, nor should we feel bad if, it, if the account loses money. But the real question is, you know, at what age do you want to make work optional? You declare the age and then you need to declare the amount. Let's say it's $80,000 a year. If we're talking about $20, $20 using the 4% rule, that means we would want to have $2 million sitting in a place where hopefully there's a five, six, maybe 7% rate of return, keeping the withdrawal rate at no more than 4%, which means that the account needs to be open with about $2 million. If we have more time, that means it needs to be more money. We need to have more money, but we need to focus on what is the amount you're trying to achieve. We want you to see your goal very clearly, not haphazardly, or think hope is a strategy. And for those of you who are already retired, what kind of uh, asset base do you need to maintain? Uh, it becomes a different question. How can we limit the losses, no matter what the market might do, so that you can survive without having to pray for a Hail Mary pass just to get back in the market? And then, you know, what happens if uh, you or your spouse or a breadwinner were to go to heaven? Uh, what does a survivor need to keep things going just the way they were so that maybe, you know, <laughs> you might miss uh, the deceased uh, as a person, but you don't uh, miss their money. <laughs> that, that's really how we want it to look like it. <laughs> that way, when you're taking care of the final uh, planning, right, uh, you're not worried about the money because uh, you know that's going to be fine and you're going to be fine emotionally, but you want, don't want to have to do the emotional hassle and the money hassle simultaneously in real time. So what should you focus on? Uh, we're, first would be spending. Do you know that um, one of the good things that might come out of this coronavirus is that people become conscious in general, that would be a good thing, but particularly relative to our spending. In America, we think it's spin, baby, spin. No matter how, no matter what, um, you know, cash or credit doesn't matter, just keep spending. But we don't recognize at some point, we're gonna get our last paycheck. And how are we going to have how much money in a place where we can continue to be capable of spending the same kind of money for the next 20, 30, maybe even 40 years. It's a big task, but it won't get any easier. And maybe instead of piling on the debt, which is what most consumers have done, we'll uh, kind of throw that habit in the trash can and recognize that if I don't pay myself first, who's gonna do it for me? 
And let's remember not long ago, the government workers, where we witnessed educated people making good money that were out of a paycheck for a month or two, and they're literally crying on TV because uh, they don't have uh, the kind of money that they need for the next month's car payment or rent payment or house payment or child care costs. That's pretty much how we roll, and maybe this will give us an opportunity, this coronavirus thing, to really recognize where are our priorities relative to each other and how we treat ourselves as well as, as each other. So what, what else should you focus on? Um, we're going to suggest that uh, you, you delete the debt, get it off your charge cards, get it to the place where it is zero. Make that important. Now, don't do the debt first and not save any money. Save money yourself first and pay down the debt while you're not spending because you didn't have the same capacity in the last two months to spend as you did uh, two years ago or even a year ago, just in December. Uh, take that money and redeploy it. Pay off the debt. And remember, when you, you sign an obligation to $1,000 a month for a car loan, can you imagine? Who would have thought that? $1,000 a month for a decent car. Well, that means if it's for a five-year loan, you have just, it's a promissory note of what, $12,000 a year, five years? That's 60 grand. That has been spoken for. It can't be spent any differently, okay? You can't uh, see an opportunity and use that money to take advantage of that opportunity or to pay down other debt. Uh, this money is promised and there's nothing really you are able to do with that money. Let's also understand that cash is king. And if it is the case that the economy turns cold again, as it very well could, for those who have the cash, they're able to pick up bargains uh, that uh, the rest of us can't when suddenly, whether it's a business or a home or a, an opportunity is uh, you know, a fraction of, of, of what its value was prior to things getting cold and harsh. And now, like GM did around the, after the Great Depression, picked up Buick and Oldsmobile from privately held mom and pop organizations, firms, mom and pop making those cars, granddaddy and granddaddy and, and, and grandson. Uh, but now they can't sell a car, which means that they have some debt They've got to sell the business for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar. Those opportunities always present themselves. That's why we need to have cash to be prepared for those opportunities. So now let's help you answer a very uh, important question. We've got a, a little two minute video here that we did and we'll send it to you if, when we're done here. We welcome and encourage you to share this video because we want to try and help you put things in perspective. Let's determine your odds of success. Here's an interesting case study. Let's suppose you are a married couple aged 65 and 62 with about $1.3 million in your retirement plans and you want to make work optional in four years. You're expecting your annual expenses to run about $72,000 a year in today's dollars. And to offset inflation, you want your income to increase for the rest of your lives through age 100. When we run the probability for success, we can see that this couple's odds stand at 83%. Those are very good odds. But now let's suppose a market hurricane hits the same account. So instead of having $1.3 million, the account is reduced to $700,000. And you still need the same income at the same time through age 100. After that severe market loss, when we go back and calculate this same scenario's odds for probability of success, we see that they stand at zero. That's right, we went from 83% to zero. It makes all of the sense in the world to see how bad things can get in advance, especially when income is expected for, on average, more than 20 years, maybe as long as 40 years in retirement. You know, savvy investors hate losses more than they love gains, and as investment advisors, we want to help all savvy investors minimize the losses so that you can keep your odds of retirement success at 80% likely or better. Let me encourage you to run your numbers so you can see what road your money is on. What are your odds of probability for success? Now would be the time to find out yeah you know now that you have more time than you thought you had right you can focus on different things you're not too busy uh focus on the money look at the video and it'll include step two which asks you a series of questions about so that you can determine how much loss is acceptable both in dollars and in percentages because what you might want to do if you can is determine how first of all foremost what loss can you live with? And now, is it possible to perhaps design a portfolio that may perform within your loss parameters? That way, if you say, gee, I can live with an 8% loss, but the market's off 40%, whatever it might be at that particular time, 
but my account is down no more than eight, or maybe slightly more than that, but certainly not close to 40, you don't have to worry about, oh my goodness, I just have to die because clearly this is not going to work and I'm going to run out of money before I run out of time. So please take a look at the video as often as you need to, to recover a lot of ground in, in two minutes and then take the time to answer the five or six questions. We'll respond with a, a report and that way it helps you get a sense for what kind of loss you can live with and then maybe the portfolio can be designed in, in such fashion where it may perform within your risk of loss parameters. That would be certainly our biggest goal. So let's, uh, let's talk about um, Mr. Sobolinski uh, because uh, he's on deck and uh, he's ready. And let me make sure I introduce him properly. Uh, he kind of gave you an outline. He is a business coach to very large businesses. Uh, he calls them small to medium, uh, but he's been responsible for overseeing the turnaround of a struggling manufacturing company, inclu including improving their EBITDA by 300%. Uh, operating efficiencies by 25%, new customer revenue by 50%, and reducing product returns and scrap by 250%, maintaining business continuity following two disasters for a manufacturing organization while improving worldwide gross margins by 5%, and increase, increasing new customer acquisition by 12%. So Michael Solinsky is an accomplished senior executive and board member with more than 25 years of aerospace defense, medical device, industrial and commercial industries. And this is the work that he does. And what I really want him to dig into is how to make your business roar like a tiger while everybody else is trying to figure out which way is up. Michael, please take it from there. Hey, John, good afternoon. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, and uh, your uh, introductory conversation is a lot of great points just to, that you covered. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to have listened to all of that as well, because those are great points that uh, everybody should listen to. So let me dive into this, because I know everybody's time is very valuable. And, and really, when you think about what makes businesses and people successful, we're going to talk about that. And ROAR, as you see here in this slide, is the ratio of accurate results the thinking, the behaviors that take place in the top 1% of successful people. It's, it's what you have to do to achieve excellence in any area of your life. And we're specifically speaking here about business and accomplishing great things in business. So the idea comes from maximizing the impact from every action taken and what actions do you need to take to have those impacts. Uh, it's from Forbes, so I'll give credit where credit due is Forbes are the people who, who created this. And uh, we'll talk about it and how it applies to your businesses. So next slide. So let's, let's dive into it a little bit, kind of give you guys an example of what I'm talking about here. Okay, what does roar mean? What does it really go on? But if you look at businesses and if you convert uh, one in 10, whether it's a business to business or business to consumer, depending on what your business is, uh, one in 10 people make a purchase or one in 10 companies make a purchase from your company. That's only 10% obviously conversion rate. And, and in typical business, you know, you go, well, we got to get 20 people through the door instead of 10 and we'll get, you know, we'll get, we'll get two people buying instead of this one. But what the war thinking and the behavior really shows is how do you get two in 10 visitors to buy? How do you change that ratio? How do you make it such that for every 10 people that come in, you absolutely double your business and get two people to buy. And, and in a, as you get better at it, what do you need to do to make three or even four people buy? So Roar thinkers are always thinking on increasing this ratio, making the numbers better for them. Uh, where regular business people are kind of, you know, you know, gutting it out, trying to figure it out. Uh, but Roar thinkers outthink the competition and they win with intelligence and thinking with their head. So you can only imagine what happens when a regular business who's trying to, to, to play the ratio the other way is going up against the head to head with a roar thinking business. The roar thinking business always wins. There's no question about it. So, um, you know, let's talk a couple examples here and then I'll get in, the, in, in a minute is you think of Steve Jobs and Apple and what he did with that company and that business. Uh, that's a perfect example of someone like this. You think of Elon Musk and what's going on with SpaceX, not to mention Tesla, but SpaceX. Today I was watching, there was a launch with NASA scheduled for today, but unfortunately weather postponed it until Saturday. 
but just think about what he's accomplished with SpaceX and now they're launching people into space with NASA. That is an example of war thinking and war business behaviors. So next slide. So there's a, there's a great book and a great movie. If you haven't read the book, read the book, uh, see the movie if you're still sitting around and have time to do so with Moneyball is the book and is the movie. And Roar Thinking is exactly what Billy Bean and the uh, Oakland Athletics did in the baseball world. It's a fantastic story. It's, it's truly the epitome of thinking differently and using data science as the key in this case to figure out how to pick the best baseball players, how to draft the best baseball players, how to trade for the best baseball players, and how to get winning results. And uh, I think Moneyball is a fantastic read and it's well worth a true story. I actually know some of the characters. Uh, Mike McNanty is a pitcher for the athletics in, in, that, uh, in that book and the, he has a chapter about him. It's not such a great chapter, but it's a true chapter in the book. Um, I, use, I use this data science actually in one form of my business where I work on business strategy and people strategy and businesses and put the two together to really form uh, strategy and talent optimization for companies and go in there and really figure out using data science how to, how to align their, their people and their strategies for optimal growth. So we can talk about that another time, but it's an exciting thing to uh, how data science really works. Another great example in the sports world is Formula One racing. If anybody in the audience understands Formula One racing, the, the specifications, the limitations, it are so tightly controlled that you have to fine tune, tweak, and really squeeze the most impact out of your vehicles and out of your drivers uh, that uh, you, you know was within the rules, uh, the limits of, uh, of Formula One uh, regulation. So, uh, you know, when I think about uh, this type of behavior, I always think about Michael Schumacher, who who raced for many years. I think it was 16 titles he won with the Ferrari Formula One team. He's a perfect example of that in the sports world. Other ones. Uh, that we all know is Michael Jordan. I mean, he's relentless. He really thinks and behaves in this manner when he was in the sports world. And even when he's playing golf off the, off the, the courts. Uh, and Kobe Bryant, of course, the late Kobe Bryant was another person who exhibited this behavior in the sports world. So John, anything you want to add before we go on to the next slide? Well, yeah, actually I, I do. I mean, the, the, I had a chance to get to Northern California to be, kick the tires with the company that wanted to do business with us. And uh, they provided the driver back and forth from the you know, airport to the hotel. And, and as I was getting back to the airport, uh, the driver said that he happened to be the owner of the company that uh, shuttles the Warriors back and forth between the stadium and the airport. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Well, yeah. Let's talk about Steph Curry. He said, well, you know what Steph does when he goes to shoot his threes? And I'm like, oh, no, geez, I'm all ears. He says his goal is to hit 100 threes in a row. And if he doesn't get to 100, he starts over. So, I mean, that, I think, is a magnificent example of someone who made up his own rules. Uh, the rest of us are going out there for half an hour, right? Going, let's see how good I could get, right? No, right. that's not how he does it. He does it from all kinds of angles. He can do it behind his back. But that's because he made up the rules and put down the gauntlet of coming up with a big, um, aggressive, ambitious goal, and then uh, went to work on it to see how he might be able to accomplish that task. Mm -hmm. and, and the rest of they say is history. He, he will probably literally go down in history as the best three ball player, or certainly the first of the best. There will be others trying to emulate him, right. but uh, he, he set the bar, the bar very, very high. Exactly, no, that's a perfect example. The same type of thing from the, from the game of basketball, just like we can make up, uh, or not make up, but uh, reflect on many stories of Kobe Bryant's behaviors as well and what he did when he was playing. And the way you train and such. Train the well, and, and by the way, uh, the other side of that equation, particularly with Steph, is I understand that uh, he was, uh, he had a, a great meeting with Nike. But guess what? The, why is it that Nike isn't his shoe supplier? Because of, the way I understand it is they didn't get the pronunciation of his first name correct. Really? <laughs> so, Interesting. I never heard that story. That's that very was interesting. Done. I'm off to my next appointment with Under Armour. Yeah. Contract. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah. It's about doing your homework and knowing who you're sitting across the table from and being yes. prepared. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Where, where he was and they weren't. So. Exactly. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. 
So, all right, let's go next slide. So, so let's talk about how this applies to business owners um, in, in every business today. Uh, you know, start by asking yourself, you know, what are really your company's objectives? Uh, how do you make a sale? How do you position your product? What are your customers? How do you develop loyalty? Uh, what are your touch points, whether it's web pages, phone calls, your storefront, if you're B2C or social media and all those things. You have to think about all this. Um, and, and are they really meeting your objectives? And how many of your objectives can you, can you meet using each touch point? You know, which one is going to accelerate your business forward? Uh, and how will you use this raw thinking for more success in your business? So we'll, we'll talk about that next in the next slides coming. So, you know, you look at, here we are on the other side. We're coming out of the other side of this pandemic, thankfully. Um, and, and this is a, this is a, a great um, quote by Deepak Chopra. Every great change is preceded by chaos. I think, I think we are all right there right now. And um, today uh, is not the same in business world as it was eight or 10 weeks ago. Uh, it's changed. Uh, we're emerging. Uh, companies are moving forward. You know, you have to ask yourself, are you, and what do you have to do to move forward? Because prior strategies um, will, will not necessarily work. Um, so you can't afford to sit down on the sidelines right now and pick things up as nothing happened. You know, pick up your ball and your bat and get going again. It's really different. So we're in a new world as economies begin to reemerge, as, as John was talking about, the dynamics are always changing. Uh, those people in business who are prepared uh, would be better suited to attract new clients and and move forward and achieve their goals and their customers' goals. So, um, all companies in all sizes, and I talk to companies every day. I spoke to many different ones uh, this week, are uh, trying to salvage their business, figure out what do they need to do to survive and where do they go from here. Um, in the near term, it, it, it's not an exaggeration to say that uh, there's going to be thousands of startup. Uh, businesses launching simultaneously. And I don't really mean that they're startups, but they look and behave like startups because they're coming out of this pandemic and, and they're having to restart the whole engine. Their markets have changed. Everything has changed about what's going on in their business. They're trying to figure out how to pivot and how to get clients back. And what does that look like? So they're behaving like a startup and it's a, a whole different world than it was 10 weeks ago. So next slide. John, if you have anything you want to say, just uh, jump in. Um, here's some information from uh, McKinsey. I forgot to reference it here on the slide, but is that 81% of small and mid-sized businesses believe that the impact will affect them for the next 12 to 16 months? I think that's I think it's very obvious. I think it's very real, and it's going to be it's very tough. I think the next one is what's really kind of scary: is 50% of small businesses may be out of business uh, by the end of this year in 2020. So all the more need for really thinking differently, looking at the business, looking at the climate, looking at everything that you're doing and um, behaving in a way that's going to propel your business forward. And, and like, I will jump in here because, yeah. you know, a lot of people are worried about the words uh, recession. Uh, you know, we don't like the word math. Um, we, we are afraid of the word depression. Uh, they're just words. But, you know, I, I think one of the things with, when it comes to the depression that is most noteworthy, excuse me, according to our research team, on a per capita basis with the Great Depression, more Americans became millionaires than any other time in history. So that's what I was alluding to when I talked about cash is king. Maybe that's where that phrase came from. But to the extent that you have the cash, you can catch the next wave because you, you can see the opportunity that you probably couldn't see if you're, as compared to those who are trying to protect their equity and hopeful that it comes back to where it was. No, we need to get it when you know, that chaos is at, at the lowest level. That's when you want to get into to, to catch the next wave. Exactly right. I, I, I speak to a lot of companies who are, are looking to do acquisitions and, and, and such and grow. And this climate for the ones who have the cash, as you were saying, cash is king, are really poised to uh, do proper acquisitions to really change the, the market uh, that they serve in their respective businesses. So lots of opportunities out there if you're positioned right or what do you have to do to pivot? We're going to talk about that right now. So let's go to the next slide and, and talk about specifically what, what can we do to really help companies. Uh, so, you know, what can you gain by being your best? Everything we're talking about here with the roar mentality is, is really, and I said this to people when I spoke at the very beginning of the pandemic, is, 
And it, and it really applies throughout and it applies as we merge out the other side here is a deeper customer connections, really connect with your customers, really foster those long-term relationships with your existing customers if they still exist. But that's something that's really key. Trust and loyalty from your customers is, is worth gold. Um, it, it's, 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 and, and they'll always remember you, I say, especially coming out the other side, if you took care of them one way or another, if it's just being there to listen for them, they'll, they'll take care of you in return. And those mutually beneficial long-term relationships is what it's all about. And more than anything else, if you take anything away, this is what's really important. It sounds simple, but it's really the foundation of building great loyalty um, in, in, your, in your relationships with your customers. Uh, next slide, please. So I think, you know, we all, we all know how to do things and what to do. And you know, there's, some, there's some good literature and books out there about why. Why do you do what you do? What's your purpose? What is your company about? And especially as we're coming out of the pandemic, why do you do what you do? And how do you take that to those outer rings? but making sure you really are, are connecting all those and, and making it all about what did the customer need today that they, uh, that, that you're, what you're serving them and what, and what they need in their business and how to better be a servant to them. So I, I think if there's anything else is, is why do you do what you do? What's your purpose? Know how to do it and be your best at doing what you and why you do it. So it's all about your why and being your best. Next slide, please. Um, when you get down to the nuts and bolts within your, within your business, reflect, you know, who's on your team? Do you have the right people on your team? Um, I, I'm gonna say this and I, I, I think it's very important. And I, I spoke a little bit about doing the, the talent optimization, the strategy and the people. In this day and age right now, coming out of pandemic, having the right people on your team is almost the most important thing. Once you figure out why and where you're going, you need to have the right people. And they may or may not be the people you had before the pandemic because your company and your market's totally different. If you need to be agile, nimble, really responsive, that's different than maybe where you were before. So you may have to change out some people and, and I can help people with that. And that's a whole other conversation. But it, 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 as we all know, people are the core of any business. And, and in this day, I'm seeing a lot of times where you have to kind of pivot and figure out what type of people you need to really be able to move forward uh, and be successful in, in this new climate. Um, you know, going back to, you know, why, you know, why did you start your business? You know, what are you doing? What's your mission and value? Reflect on that. Make sure you understand that it's clear to you. And then what is your service product offering you're doing? Are you really giving them the proper solution? Um, challenges, what is the impact for your business on the people, the customers and financial impact? What challenges are out there? Kind of do a SWOT analysis and figure out really where you stand with your business as you start to move forward and figure out the, the next steps. Uh, there's a lot in there that has to be done. It starts with the people. And really doing a deep SWOT analysis is important in figuring out the challenges and the opportunity. So next slide, please. So when you do all that, and I talked about this a little bit, it's like you pivot. What is a new service or offering that you can provide that will help your customers? You know, it may not be what you did before. So what do you have to do differently? Uh, what can your company do to influence and help with short-term concerns? Uh, what are the needs of the customers? How do you do it? How do you adjust your business to help your people, uh, the service, your community? It's all about your actions and where you go from here. You have to look at your unique, your unique selling proposition, your USP and your brand and figure out what that needs to be to help your customers now. It's gotta do it now because if you don't, you're gonna get passed by by the people who are doing it, the companies that are agile and nimble and are using roar thinking, they're gonna blow right by you. So you need to do that stuff right now to drive your business forward. Let's get into a couple other things. Um, next slide, please. So I think I already say now is not the time uh, for more of the same. We've got to change. We got to, and we're going to talk about review, reassess, and realign, and we'll wrap up. Uh, I think we're doing good on time here, so I just want to go through this. But it, I, I, I can't emphasize enough 
It's yeah, not... and Michael, let me just comment to, to folks on uh, listening that uh, you can chat or send your messages to Daniel and he'll have some questions that he poses for both of us. And Perfect. that, of course, is right in the middle. Uh, and then he'll be ready to uh, wrap us up, uh, but with uh, first our question and answer period. Okay, very good. So uh, let's go to the next slide and review. Um, so I've spoken about this in a couple of different ways, but review your market and competitive shifts. What's going on? Is your market growing now if you're fortunate because of what's been going on or is it shrinking and at what rate and what do you need to do to, to move forward? Uh, what technology and other disruptors are taking place? What's going on? And who are the emerging players and practices in the industry? Uh, I'll tell you one story. I think, John, I think I might have shared this, so I'll share it with an audience. I'm working with a company right now that is um, doing uh, temperature scanning systems for businesses. Uh, so everybody walks into a school, a business office, a gym, a restaurant, an office building. It, it scans and, and takes their temperature. It can do groups of about 10 people with one camera system. You know, that business is booming. You know, that wasn't an interesting business 10 weeks ago. Today, it's the most relevant business out there. You know, it's a market created by it. So we're figuring out what do they really need to do to capitalize on it. Some of it is obvious, but some of it is also, you know, making sure all the, all the pieces align properly to be successful and serve their customers. So that's a perfect example of a, of a market that emerged. Uh, there's a few other examples of that, but that's a good one. It's, it's very pertinent. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, reevaluate when you look at all that, reevaluate your client ranking criteria. You know, who is and what does your perfect client look like based on everything we've been talking about? You need to understand that. Then, what does the sales cycle look like now in this new world we're in? Is it shortened or is it lengthened? What's changed? What are the buying decisions? I talk about the buyer process here. Has the deal values gone up? Have they gone down? Are they about the same? You need to understand all that and assess everything to understand really how to move your business forward. So understanding these things and what is the available market share? You got to reassess it. You have to understand it. You really need to understand the details in order to capitalize. Think through that analytical, the whole roar of the accurate results is making sure that you understand every aspect of your business, assess it and be able to move forward effectively. Uh, next slide, please. So realigning, um, this is the last thing we're going to wrap up on here, is um, once you do all that and you, and you reassess, uh, you got to realign, re-rank uh, re your existing prospects. Some of your people in your pipeline, they may not even be a prospect anymore. But when you figure out all the stuff we talked about before, re-rank your existing prospects and know who to go after specifically right now. You know, who are your prospects? Who are your clients? And what is that market? And what does it look like and go after it? Reset up your goals. Be very visual. Uh, communicate your goals. Be explicit. Make it clear to all your employees, all your potential customers, who you are, what you're doing, and why you're doing it. Once again, why? Uh, and make it happen. Staff up. Uh, you got to get that team back together, uh, whether it's a sales team, your operations team, your marketing team, the people that are going to help you take this forward and really drive it fast and beat the competition right now. You have to do that. Um, and another thing just to kind of wrap up is just really engage uh, your account-based marketing and account-based sales practices for your top targets, meaning be very specific. If you're going after, let's just make up something, if you're going after HP, you know, an old time company or something. Everybody knows HP, so I'm using it. It, it as, as a client. Make sure you understand everything about what you're doing and what their buying process is and what you have to do to go win that business and detail it out. Be specific, be better than the next guy. So when you go into HP, you're going to be able to win and close that deal. So um, that's really it from here. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. I, I hope this helps. I hope it gets the message across of what you have to do to really improve the results using some of the examples I gave uh, from both sports and business world and how it applies to the small and mid-sized company businesses out there. So um, that's what I got, John. Well, I mean, uh, I thought you had some great ideas and let me uh, let the audience know. I mean, you know, it's one thing to talk about ideas and uh, come up with examples of people who have very been very good at execution you know uh, 
of setting forth what it is, their goals and whatnot. And uh, I just want the audience to know that uh, uh, personally, Michael uh, lost his mother very early this morning. Uh, and, and yet he's here doing this for us. So, I mean, if that is an example of a person you can now see live and in color, right? Of, uh, uh, and I asked him, I said, you know, I, I don't ask, I don't say to people, I'm sorry for your loss. I, I let go of that. I have a new habit. I ask, uh, what do you want the world to remember, in this case, your mother for? And he says, wow, that's a great question. Give me a minute. And in about 30 seconds, he came back with, well, her perseverance. That's what I want people to remember her for. So, you know, it, I, I think it's a beautiful thing to deal with life as best as we can, right? Uh, and yet, uh, stay true to our calling and not get so sidetracked <laughs> or distracted and uh, keep giving the best. And clearly, exactly. here's an example of our good friend here uh, demonstrating those concepts uh, right before our very eyes. So yeah. I, I really appreciate it. No, thank you, John. I appreciate that. No, it's absolutely true. And I think there's many examples besides myself doing that, but there's many examples across business and sports where people have uh, you know, persevered and, and uh, moved on in, in what they have to do at the moment and take care of the mission that we need to do. So, yes. Absolutely. So, Daniel, if you would uh, see what questions we have and open up my video, please. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. First question for you is, in this new environment, where do you where do you suggest companies market, or how do they market? Well, I, I think that's going to go back to, um, you, you know, what is their business? Uh, you, you know, going back to it's a specific, we have to figure out if the B two C or if the B two B businesses, you know, how who is who are they marketing to? You know, so are we going through social media, through the web? through digital advertising, through, um, you know, what really depends on the type of business and who are their clients and what do they really need to do, um, you know, to reach those people. I saw a great thing. I'll just give you an example. Uh, this is a B2C, uh, a consumer. It was a local restaurant in the area. Um, and, and they sent out a nice little discount card with the picture of the owners. They're like, hey, we're local, we're, we're local owners. You know, here's a discount for yourself, I think for $5. And, and here's one to give to a friend, you know, so that they made the effort of putting these little things together in a mail or sending them out to people, making it personal and telling people, come into our restaurant. You know, we're here, we're open, we're local like you. And, and let's do this together. So, you know, that's a perfect example of something that reaches out in a really direct way, hits people right in the way that they can relate to them. And, and moves their business forward. So I use as a as an example of something in the B2C side. That's a great example, thank you. Uh, next question for you. How do you let go of the old and embrace the new? <laughs> you know, I, I, I've said this so many times to people. It, it, you know, we haven't figured out how to reverse time. Time's going forward, are you? You know, we, you have to go forward. You have to move forward. If you're not moving forward, you, you know, where are you? You, 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 you know, so, you can't hang on to the past. It's all about the future. I've said the past doesn't need, you know, the past doesn't need equal the future. I mean, whatever, however you want to say it, it's all about moving forward, forgetting about what worked before. I tell people, I sit in front of them, I say, you know, we got to figure out what's going to work tomorrow. You know, what does your customers want tomorrow? I don't care what they wanted back in February. Those days are gone. We need to figure out what we need to do tomorrow to make your business successful. Well, I so, to back up what you're saying, I, I you know, I, I do believe that, uh, you become who you hang around with. So at least I'm, that's wishful thinking on my part. So I <laughs> yeah. try to hang around people like Michael and everybody else who's much smarter than I am. Cause I believe, you know, if you sleep with dogs, you get fleas. If I talk to smart people, I might get a little bit smarter. And I had a chance to spend some time with a rocket scientist. I mean, this guy is brilliant, you know, three PhDs. I mean, I could understand half of what he said, but the one thing that he said that I'll never forget uh, you know, because a lot of us are looking at some of the situations we find ourselves in, or we're looking at um, what's going on, and we're wondering, are we going backwards? So his answer was, the universe is expanding at the speed of light. Now, I don't know how fast that is, <laughs> but clearly we're not going backwards. Right. So in spite of everything, right, or how difficult or how challenging COVID-19, you know, we, we mm -hmm. want to survive and thrive. Clearly, the, 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 the universe, according to him, 
is moving forward. So yeah. I'm like, okay, that's good. I'm really glad to hear that. We're not going backwards. So let's let's step up and, and move forward. Exactly. I mean, it's another way of putting it, but it's it, you don't have a choice. You can't go that way. There, we haven't figured it out. The physicists and no one's figured it out. So um, that's the only way to go, uh, Daniel. So to answer that question, you have to. If you're going to thrive, survive, and be one of those roar thinkers and, and, and have a business that behaves in that manner, you need to move forward and think about what is going to work tomorrow, today and tomorrow for your business. Thank you, Michael. Next question, this question is for John. In regards to planning, how do you, how do you project expenses for 20, 10 or 20 years out? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, first, we would take what your expenses are today. And most people don't know. So in fact, when we're meeting with clients, one of the things we uh, require of them is to provide their expenses, to look at their, that what they're spending in an average month, not the last two months, take it three months back and, and look at every line item and make sure that you both understand the practice of how, how you're putting your money, what you're doing with the money that you earn. Okay. I mean, th here's a different example for you, but, but that, that's a direct answer. You got to look at what your costs are and not you know, the house can be paid off, not in the future. No, what are they today? Because if you're making $80,000, you're probably pretty used to spending $80,000. Whatever the number is, take it from where it is right now. It, one couple we've had the pleasure of working with, this, the, the husband uh, sold uh, two businesses, about $2.5 million each, just so happened to come up with $5 million. By the way, they do not think they're rich. They just know that they do better than most. But, and so it turns out the 4% withdrawal provides them with $200,000. That's how they roll. That's how they live. That's their preference. But notice this, they, they like to go to Belgium and France and Italy, as I recall, typically on vacations, or at least they used to. And what they did, they spoke the language of math. They weren't afraid to use the word budget. And they put aside, uh, like I think it was $21,500, if my memory is correct. That's our budget for our vacation. And we put it in an account and both of us have access to it, wherever we are. And then we go look at that account as we're getting closer to see the amount dwindle. And as the amount gets closer to zero, we start packing. <laughs> we don't have any regrets. We know we'll be back next year. We spent what we were allotted. We didn't spend any more than what we were allotted. We had a great time. This is how we do it. But it's how we do it. Both of them know the game they're playing so that either one of them, you know, didn't, wasn't overly dependent on the other one. Well, you figured it out and then you tell me, and then I resent you. No, you were in this together. Let's, let's figure out what game we're playing and make sure that we're playing by our rules that we have established. Yeah. Good answer, John. Next question for you, John. What's with the pandemic surcharge? Oh, that's a, that's, that's a new question. In fact, that came up. Uh, it looks like I'll be on a news interview soon answering that question. This is, this is something that businesses have created. And, and the first concern people wonder about is, okay, you're trying, is that a gotcha moment? You're, you're just trying to add on something? No, think of it as, you know, there's some situations like the business used to only have to clean once a month, once a week. Now they have to clean every day. There are additional expenses that have uh, uh, cropped up in this COVID thing. Uh, and so some businesses are passing on kind of like inflation those additional costs to the, to the customers, uh, and some customers resent this. Uh, and the other part of the equation is uh, a lot of these businesses, Quincy Crosby says 54% of us don't have resources outside of 30 days. Businesses are much the same. We don't have enough profit margins in the equation. Uh, you know, a peer of ours says that his income is down 30%. That, that's pretty traumatic. Uh, that's not our story. Thank you very much. But it, it just means that people have to make adjustments. So in some cases, you be not surprised to see a COVID surcharge show up on your bill. You might ask about what the details are, but I, I, I'm really trying to keep people from saying, oh, see, they're trying to take advantage of me again. Well, a lot of these businesses have, a, I mean, when's the last time you saw the economy, 70, 75% of the economy come to a complete stop? But of course, your expenses don't stop. So they're trying to get back on their feet. Uh, we're all having a, a tough time. So that's part of why I say, I, I hope we maybe learn how to recognize we're all in this together and maybe we can help each other get along to, to go along. 
Excellent. Thank you, guys. In the interest of time, we're going to start wrapping it up. Uh, join us for the next, every Wednesday for the for foreseeable future. Next week, we're going to be talking about passive versus active man, investment management. We're going to have uh, an asset manager that we've done business with for quite a long time talk about how they manage money and what they define as a distinction between active and passive management. Yeah, and, and let me jump in here. This is uh, what, we're, what, we're, what we're saying is the industry, the financial services, the securities industry has told everybody one thing, buy and hold, sit and take it, buy cheap, get index funds and forget it. Either put in more money or stop whining. There are better ways to go, or let's say different ways to go for your situation perhaps. So we're distinguishing, we're gonna be explaining what is passive, like 2008, you held the, number of, the same number of shares throughout the 37% market loss, which was the average. Does the share balance remain the same as opposed to uh, active? The share balance was moved to cash in 2008, moving the money off the railroad tracks for the train to run. And then we get back in when there's more of a melt up as, a, as, a, as compared to a meltdown. So we'll be explaining all of that. This is something that we'd really like for you to, to join us on. It, it's a different conversation. You're, you're hearing more advertising as far as uh, passive, you know, buy uh, an exchange traded fund, buy uh, the cheapest mutual fund you can find and just hold it. Mm. That might work when you don't need the money. I can tell you it's hard for it to work when you do need the money in, in some cases. Uh, being a passive investor might have been your friend when you're making contributions and that friend can sometimes become your foe when you're taking withdrawals particularly at a time when the market is declining excellent and if you haven't been to our website make sure you you visit it we post all of the interviews that john does there's quite a few of them now some of them with uh, 30 and 50 thousand views each one our website's on the screen www.yvpoor.com and if you weren't prepared for the last two months financially, you're not prepared for the next 20 years. So let's figure out how to get you prepared. Can you, can you go back to our schedule? What else do we have on, on the docket for the schedule? You tip, ah, this is a psychologist who's going to be talking about the issues that people are bringing up to their therapists. You know, a number of issues. And, and, and they're not bad. They're just, this is the reality that we're in. So let's deal with it. I love what Joan Rivers used to say. If you can laugh at it, you can deal with it. And one of his best lines is, the only way out is through. So let's figure out how to get through. And then we'll be, uh, on the 17th, we'll be talking with a client who has gotten involved with one of the programs we've made donations to. She's now on the board of this particular program and she'll be describing you know, how what she's doing it gives her satisfaction uh, to kind of balance working very hard. So that's what we have on tap. And we'll continue, uh, Daniel and, and, and uh, Jasmine keep saying, we got to do these weekly, so we'll keep doing these. Tune in, please, and, and please feel free to, to share the invite. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Michael. All right, take care. Be well. Be well as well.